Every time it seems that someone tries to make a film about witchcraft, because they try to market it, they have to distort it to make it into something either evil or silly or stupid. And it is something that is very, very sacred. People love witches. They love dressing up as witches. They love making playlists inspired by quote unquote witchy vibes. They like listening to Rhiannon under a full moon and making believe Stevie Nicks was singing about them all along. It doesn't stop there. The entertainment industry loves the idea of witches. As heroes, as evil incarnate, as a plot device for when they don't have any other ideas. This fascination with witchcraft and the occult goes back centuries. Many of the ideas we have about witches stem from ancient folklore. Folklore that exacerbated the already heightened anxieties regarding paganism. These rampant fears and disastrous consequences are the reason the term witch hunt even exists. There have been hundreds, maybe even thousands of witch hunts throughout history and all over the world. The case of Theris of Lemnos is the oldest and most detailed account of a witch trial, dating back to before 323 BC. Witch hunts and the executions that typically followed them were so popular and so widespread that in 785 AD, the Council of Paderborn basically said, yo, please stop killing women and saying you did it because they were witches. Stop it. It was, and still is, a fear of the unknown that keeps people so fascinated. Frankly, most people, especially people in the entertainment industry, know very little about actual witches. Which is why so many depictions of witchcraft are either extremely silly, or extremely twisted, or extremely just not at all real. Entertainment in general is the practice of making a spectacle out of the seemingly mundane. But with witchcraft, this spectacle has always been so vastly different from reality that it's warranted some raised eyebrows by, you know, actual witches. For a long time in Hollywood and everywhere else, witches and witchcraft were the common antagonist in movies and TV. In The Conjuring, there's a whole ass demon haunting a family of seven and somehow it's still a witch's fault. The positive depiction of witches were far and few between, and while still usually inaccurate, it was refreshing for witches to see themselves as the main characters, as the good guys, for once. In The Wizard of Oz, the same movie that started the trope of witches being green and wearing pointy hats, there was also Glinda, the good witch, who came down on a bubble dog. A lot of the positive depictions of witchcraft might be owed to Bewitched, a classic sitcom that ran from 1964 to 1972. Bewitched was mad popular, mad beloved, people watched it almost religiously, fun for the whole family. Without Samantha, there probably wouldn't have been a Louise, or a Sabrina, or a Marnie. But even these characters, whose witchiness wasn't a point of contention, still had problems with the actual witchcraft. It was, as Feruza put, distorted, made silly, made something that it wasn't. And then the craft happened. The Craft was the brainchild of Peter Filardi, who collaborated on the screenplay with writer-director Andrew Fleming. Fleming famously didn't want to direct the film, as he'd just come off of directing a horror movie called Bad Dreams. He feared he would end up doing the same thing twice, so initially he only planned to help write the script. But in his own words, the story put a spell on him, and he realized he not only wanted to direct this movie, he needed to. I didn't want the witches to have pointed hats or fly around on broomsticks. I did want it to feel authentic. The witch movies always been like, the, they had black pointed hats and they were green. And I was like, let's make a movie that feels like it's what they actually do. Shortly before production began, Fleming recruited the help of a practicing witch to assist in making sure their depictions of witchcraft were respectful weren't harmful, and were as accurate as it could be while still being entertaining. In fact, the age-old trope of witches being devil worshippers is made of pretty early on in the movie. Hey, do, do you guys worship the devil? <laughs> <laughs> When the script started circulating the offices of agents and managers around LA, Rachel True was so enamored by the story that she fought tooth and nail to be part of it. She was so insistent that after her first agent refused to put her up for the role, she got a new agent who would and did. If anyone's gonna be a little black witch in this town, it's me. Side note, my Halloween costume a couple years ago was inspired by Rochelle, but no one in my real life actually recognized it, so I mentioned Rachel True on Twitter, and she told me I look like I should start my own coven, so she's amazing, and she's right. 
That's all. The thing that attracted the cast members and Andrew Fleming to the story was how simple it was. I mean, sure, that one scene has like a million snakes and rats, and that's not a very simple thing to do, but the story itself is simple. It's less of a spectacle and more of a character study. The craft works and is so endearing because it's driven by its characters, not by its plot. It's a movie about witchcraft, yeah, but it's just as much a movie about friendship and grief and the trials of girlhood. The story follows Sarah, a girl who's just moved to Los Angeles. For a long time, Sarah has been able to do things, things like this, and she doesn't realize that it's witchcraft until she meets three outcasts, Rochelle, Bonnie, and Nancy. The four of them forge a bond, becoming friends, and a small coven. Magic plays a big role in the story, but the bigger parts are the girls' experiences. Sarah is still dealing with depression and reeling from the aftermath of a suicide attempt. Rochelle is the only black girl at an all-white school, and this doesn't just make her an outcast, but the target of incessant, racist bullying. Bonnie, who was in a fire as a child, is shunned by the school for the burns that cover 90% of her body and still cause her pain. Nancy's dealing with poverty, a negligent mother, and an abusive, alcoholic stepdad. In this movie, magic isn't inherently a bad thing. Sarah meets an older woman who knows all about magic, how to use it, how not to abuse it, and overall, it's framed as something positive. It gives the girls something to believe in, a haven to escape to, and something sacred that they can all share. The power itself isn't dangerous. It's the abuse of it. The movie's success at the box office was pretty good, it was number one and went on to become what the pros call a moderate success. Critically, the reviews were mixed. I know, right? The Craft is a masterpiece. And if you're watching this video, you probably think The Craft is a masterpiece. Mixed reviews? Great mix with phenomenal, maybe. No, actually, I want to read some of these. <laughs> I still don't know what the intention of the craft was. Was it supposed to be a comedy? A thriller? A horror flick? More like a music video if you ask me. It's a depressingly mundane affair which can't make up its mind whether it's a comedy or a teen romance or a horror thriller. What is with these two reviews? Where is the comedy in the craft? Where are the jokes that would make one confused as to whether this is a comedy or not? Was it the racism? There is a pubic hair in my brush. Oh no, wait, wait. That's just one of Rochelle's little nappy hairs. <laughs> Was that the funny part? Why are you doing this to me, Laura? Do you think you're funny? You really want to know why? Yes, I really want to know why. Because I don't like Negroids. <laughs> oh, that was... That's so funny. Was it Sarah's suicide attempt? What about teen romance? Where was the romance? Was it when Chris was gaslighting Sarah or when he tried to rape her? It's also romantic, I just can't tell. It's not very competent on any level. The young actresses acquit themselves as well as is possible given the inane screenplay and the putrid concept. Margaret. What do you mean putrid? That's strong words about this what film, David. Putrid? I mean, it's, it's just so starless and dull. I, I think you're being really hard on it. Despite the critical meh, the movie basically became an instant classic, only growing more adored and more revered as time went on. Basically now, it's to the point that if one were to say, mention the mere idea of remaking it, people get kind of defensive. Because what do you need to remake? What was wrong with it? Was there something wrong with it? The Craft Legacy is a remake of the... Oh wait, no, it's... It is a standalone sequel, okay. The Craft Legacy is a standalone sequel to The Craft, not a remake. And though this movie is the first time The Craft has been sequeled or rebooted, it's definitely not the first time that other films have borrowed from The Craft. Whether that borrowing is the design of the poster or the plot or something else, once The Craft came out and became part of the world, it also became somewhat of a standard for other supernatural teen thrillers to model themselves after. So, as much as I'd like to dive right into the movie in the fucking title, I also want to take my time and look at other stories inspired directly by the cult classic. You can skip if you don't care about those. There, there will be a time stamp in the thingy. The spell that was cast in director Andrew Fleming didn't end by the time the craft debuted. 
He still wanted to be part of that world. He even wrote a pilot for a TV show that would have been an extension of that universe. He presented it to Fox Network with episodes written, and he even knew what song should be the theme song, a cover of How Soon Is Now by the band Love Spit Love, which he also used in the soundtrack of the movie. But Fox didn't want to produce it, but they also didn't want to let it go. So when the WB expressed interest in making the show, it didn't go well. Hey, can I... Can I have that? No. This is mine. But you're not using it. I couldn't help but notice that you're not using it. it I'm gonna use it. Okay. When- Back off! And the WB backed off. Letting go of the show about four young women living their normal lives all the while doing witchcraft. Then two years later... I don't think Charmed is like an exact shot-for-shot -shot television adaptation of the craft. In fact, I don't think any of the movies I'm going to mention are exact replicas. They all have different story beats, different character arcs, different phenomenons. But Charmed is still, at the end of the day, a ripoff of the craft, right down to the theme song. There were slight differences in the show so that the similarities weren't too obvious. The craft takes place in LA, so Charmed takes place in San Francisco. The girls in the craft are misfits brought together by magic. The girls in Charmed are actual sisters whose magic is part of their lineage. Of course, there are huge differences, particularly in the lore of it all. Charmed is also not as grounded in reality as the craft. It's very much like the media depictions before it, with magic being a spectacle. Less focus on character study and more on... <sighs> Charm lasted for eight seasons, beginning in 1998 and bowing out in 2006. Wait. It ended in 2006. 2006. What else happened in- Oh, right. The same year that The Craft for Boys was number one at the box office. Yeah, this was number one at the box office. But he was either this or Neo Ned, so I think we got lucky. The Covenant is like the craft, but it's related to Twilight and Pulse, you know, blue as fuck. Everyone's played by a model. Steven Strait was a model. Taylor Kitchen, his sunshine fades, was a model. This marble guy was a model. Everyone's a model. And so the acting is, well, it's, it's this right here. Let's put a spell on Kate. What are you talking about? What kind of spell? Creation. Spiders. They're taking it to a hospital in Gloucester. Wait. Don't do anything until we know We're talking what about Kate! Oh! The story is that these four guys are not only best friends, but they're all descendants of the first four families to settle in Ipswich, Massachusetts. Yes, next to Salem, because if it was in Salem, that'd be two on the nose. They're here. Who are they? Of All of these families were practicing Wiccans, and powers have been handed down from generation to generation. But there was a fifth family that had been killed off in a witch trial centuries ago. But because there's no one left in their lineage, no one really talks about the family, so they don't really know the family. So when this new guy comes to town and people start dropping dead all of a sudden, there's no way he could be the fifth son from the fifth family. That'd be crazy. He is, though. Our main character is Stephen Strait. He's an already powerful warlock, but because he's about to turn 18, his powers are going to become even stronger because in this movie, when a warlock turns 18, they ascend, there's so much exposition. The Covenant is definitely more along the lines of an action than anything else. We don't know much about the characters except that they're all models who go to high school. One of them likes Stephen King. Yeah, Dreamcatcher was the shit. Or just that one Stephen King book that Stephen King himself hates because he wrote it while he was tripping Major Balsack. One of them has a girlfriend. Oh, two of them have girlfriends. None of them have chemistry, so it's easy to forget that. Basically, none of the characters really matter, so we make up for it with really cool action scenes and explosions and CGI spiders. Look at these CGI spiders. This ain't your mom's the craft. This craft has brawn, booze, and bare ass. Watch it now on Spike TV. Once again, the magic in this movie is less of a vehicle for a character-driven story and more of like, 
Listen, we didn't really flesh out any of these characters, so look at the magic they can do. That's cool, right? This one's the main character. This one looks like Jesse McCartney. This one's Taylor Kitsch. <laughs> Sebastian Stan reveals his evil ways, hurts some people, tries to kill 10,000 BC, fails, and the movie ends there. It's, um, it is what it is. That's all I can say. The main thing I don't like about this one is how badly it wants to be cool. It has an intro similar to The Craft, you know, ancient script, fire, guitar riffs, spliced in together real fast. Except in The Craft, this montage, if you want to call it that, lasts for six seconds. Literally six seconds. In The Covenant, it goes on for well over a minute and it is full of exposition. It's the exposition that stalls the story in a way. You can't just experience the world and learn by being with the characters. You have to first take a course and get a passing grade before you can even watch the movie. That's trouble. So Caleb tells me you guys are swimmers. So Caleb tells me you guys are swimmers. In short, Chronicle is still the best boy version of the craft. I think Chronicle is a great movie. I don't want to kiss the asses of Max Landis and Josh Trank, especially not Landis given his whole thing. I just think Chronicle is easily the best thing either of them have done. It's easily the most put together, the most well paced, well paced and focused thing either of them have done. Since making Chronicle, Max Landis went on to make notorious films like Victor Frankenstein and Bright, neither of which is as decent as Chronicle. What makes Chronicle so good isn't all down to the special effects like the Covenant or to the lore. There really is no lore. Seriously, we barely know anything about how any of them get their abilities, and it's better that way because the how isn't nearly as important as the impact it leaves. Like the craft, Chronicle uses telekinesis to do a character study. And though the movie does have other leads, Michael B. Jordan as Steve Montgomery and Alex Russell as Matt, the character whose arc is the most impressive, the most sympathetic, the character who we follow for majority of the film, is Andrew Detmer. I really think Dane DeHaan is a magnificent actor. I do. When I first saw Chronicle, I was so amazed by his performance that I went and watched everything he did before that. Yes, even Devil's Not. And yeah, okay, sometimes he picks his movies by dartboard, what of it. Life's too short to just do good movies anyway. He's had roles in other films that I found to be quite magnetic. His role as Lucian Carr in Kill Your Darlings is memorable. He's an absolute flirt and Daniel Radcliffe playing Allen Ginsberg is absolutely smitten with him. And as a viewer, you get it. Dane performs it in such a way that you begin to think of yourself as Alan, just as Taken. His acting in Chronicle is one of those performances that you find yourself drawn to. The movie is a found footage type deal, and his performance elevates it so much simply because when you watch him, it's very easy to forget that he's acting. You're not watching Dane DeHaan go from lonely, hurt, and misunderstood kid to vengeful anarchist. You're watching Andrew. Andrew is real so you feel for him even more. I'm focusing on his performance so much because without it, I think Chronicle would be a fine movie, but it wouldn't be as great as it is now without Dane so easily making the character more alive. Like I said already, I like the movie, I do, but it's basically the craft and juice with telekinesis. Andrew is just Tupac and Nancy Downs. Crazy, man. You know what? When you said that last time, I was kind of tripping, right? You don't even exist now, to me. You are nothing. You are shit. I am crazy. But you know what else? Right? Lying is not your guilty when it comes to the truth. You're treating them like whores. You do not give a fuck about shit. And that's gonna stop. I don't give a fuck about Steel. And I don't give a fuck about Raheem either. I don't give a fuck about myself. And I don't give a fuck about Raheem either. I don't give a fuck about myself. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I ain't never gonna be shit. And you less of a man than me, so as soon as I decide that you ain't gonna be shit. not believe I just said that. In the near 25 years since the craft has been around, there have been many reinterpretations and inspirations taken from the film, but a Chronicle is by far the strongest, and it's even more tragic. In the craft, Nancy kinda loses her shit a little bit, a little, and tries to kill Sarah, but in the end, she kills no one. No one in the coven dies. And Chronicle, Andrew kills Steve, who is not only a vital part of their trio, but by Andrew's own admission, 
his first and only real friend. The worst part is that Andrew didn't mean for it to happen. Nancy full on tries to kill Sarah. Bishop is pretty much okay with killing, well, anybody, but Andrew didn't mean to do any of it. It's his grief, not his anger, that starts his rampage. And you feel bad for him. Despite everything he does, honestly, you kind of just want to give him a hug. There are other movies that I could talk about, I guess. The Witch Files, but oh wait, I already did that. This story has no substance, which really sucks because it doesn't have style either. Bloodcraft and The Coven both have posters that are basically the craft, but the stories aren't similar enough to warrant comparison. Bloodcraft is about two sisters reanimating their dead father to get revenge on him for abusing them as kids. Just take my word for it, it sounds so much better than it actually is. Just trust me on this. As for the coven, the girls in this movie aren't witches. They're like being hunted by witches. I don't know. I never saw the movie. And after seeing the trailer, I don't intend to. We stay together! No, stay away from me! So with all of that out of the way, let's dig into this latest version of the craft. 20 minutes in. I'm sorry. Zoe Lister-Jones was intentionally evasive about calling her second feature film a reboot or a remake. I very much wanted to tell a new story that lived within the container of the original. I always call it a reimagining. And that's precisely what The Craft Legacy is. A reimagining and somewhat of a continuation. I think all fans of the original film can appreciate this. In 2015, when news of a remake first started to circulate, Farouz Zabak respectfully tweeted that she personally was wasn't a fan of remakes and that there are great ideas out in the world that have yet to be told. Remakes in general tend to be lazy, usually rehashing the same things we've seen before, only this time lacking originality or any entertainment value. The craft legacy not being a remake works in its favor because as lowbrow as elite film scholars consider the original to be, trying to remake it leaves big shoes to fill. I want to begin my review by saying the cast and crew have my respect. You can tell that this Mr. Jones in particular has the utmost respect for the original. At the age of 13, the director shaved her head and she recalls being bullied a lot for the way she presented herself. Seeing the craft was uplifting for her. She told Vogue magazine, It was so revelatory to feel represented in mainstream pop culture. Suddenly there was power in being a weirdo. Lister Jones also recruited the help of a few practicing witches as consultants, Pam Grossman, Brie Luna, and Aaron Vogel. These consultants wrote spells, fake ones that would feel authentic while also being ineffective because spirits don't know whether it's a movie or not. Three out of the four main cast members, Gideon Adlin, Lovey Simone, and Zoe Luna, describe themselves as practicing witches. They love crystals, they do moon rituals together. Behind the scenes, magic played a real role in forging a bond between these girls. Ultimately, I think everyone on set respected the craft, both the original movie and the actual practice, and I appreciate that. That being said, I did not like this movie. Legacy is mostly an original story. A young girl, Lily, who's never had many friends, whose best friend is her mother, is plunged into a new world after her mother falls in love with David Duchovny, like we all have at one point. Having only lived in an all-woman household, things change when she and her mother move in with Duchovny and his three sons. Here, she's affronted with strict rules, almost stepbrothers who are emotionally closed off, and being harshly reprimanded for defending herself. The whole situation is a transparent and, dare I say, unimaginative metaphor for how stifling it is to be a girl coming of age in a patriarchal society. Lily experiences the harsh ways of patriarchy not just at home but at school where this happens. Autobiography, which Ew. Was its God, you seen this? Uh, Timmy? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, what's, what's going on? Hey, hi. I think you dropped something. For those of you who don't have periods, let me explain something. A couple of weeks, sometimes a couple of days before a person's period starts, they usually feel it coming. Dull aches in the lower stomach, lower back, some people get headaches. Most people know their body's signs, and they expect their period well before it arrives. And yeah, sometimes it's late, sometimes it's early, but usually, regardless of its regularity, one can feel it start. 
Now, this isn't always the case. Sometimes a person's period can start and they might not even know it started if the flow is light. But shortly after this scene, one of the girls, Frankie, tells Lily that she has a heavy flow and that it should be celebrated. And that's fine. Only that a person with a flow as heavy as this, to the point that it's running down her leg and onto the floor, to the point that it's puddled in her seat, they would undoubtedly feel that. They would feel it coming out, and okay, if they didn't feel it coming out, they would feel the wetness. It's impossible not to feel that. It's like the shining down there. This moment is basically the catalyst for Lily to meet the other three girls that would make them a coven. And also because this movie is unafraid to dive in headfirst with themes celebrating womanhood and intersectional feminism, it's meant to be here. And I'm here for that. And there's no reason that this scene shouldn't exist. It's just that it, it could have easily been a scene where instead of literature, for instance, they're in like math class and Lily has to go up to the board to solve a problem and oh, there's a red spot on her jeans. It's such a small thing to fuss over, but after watching the entirety of this movie twice, I think it's the amount of blood in this scene that defines the main flaw of the film overall. It's just too much. As much as I appreciate the themes Lister Jones wanted to incorporate, I also am a firm believer that less is more, especially in a movie with a 90 minute runtime. One of the first things I noticed when I watched it was not only how much exposition there was, but also how much of that exposition was rushed. In the first 16 seconds, there's a rush of dialogue between three of the girls. Their words are overlapping and coming and going so fast that, you know, I put this on to have a good time and I'm honestly feeling so attacked right now. In the first 16 seconds, we learn that the three girls have been looking for a fourth that they've been trying with no luck for two years, that each crescent moon is an element, that freezing time is a possibility. In 16 seconds, let me breathe. It's our fire. I don't know why we keep trying without a fourth. Oh, here she goes. What? It's been two years. Maybe we don't need a fourth. Yeah, you need a fourth. <laughs> each crescent moon is an element. See? North, south, east, west. <laughs> I want to waste time. The exposition here is not only a lot, but there's no natural reason for it to exist at all. What I mean is that these three witches know each crescent moon is an element. They know the four corners. They've been doing this for at least two years. So this exposition is both an info dump and a gratuitous info dump because it's information that they already know. Why would they be explaining it to each other? That doesn't make sense. All four girls come together, the coven is complete, and immediately things start working out. Although the film's pacing struggles overall, the scenes that feel the most rushed and crammed together are, ironically, the scenes involving the actual craft. Magic and all explanations of it are given in awkward bits of dialogue as each character takes turns explaining things to Lily. We're constantly being told, rarely if ever being shown. We're told that the girls are outcasts. You can uh, sit with us if you want. Not that anybody really wants to sit with us anyways. We're told pointedly what each of their elements are. No, because you see, we each have an element that corresponds to a direction. I'm fire. Air. Earth. So you've got north, south, east, but west. That was a tough get. <laughs> your water, your west. The term is calling the corners. We're told what each stage of magic is, I think. I didn't know there were stages. And just like with The Covenant, this overuse of exposition stalls the story, and the amount of storylines blurs the main story, making it unclear and unfocused. I don't really want to speak on the magic. I'm actually re-recording this portion into what I've already finished because I was trying to wash dishes after watching this movie and I could not stop thinking about it. This is the equivalent of me circling back after finishing an argument with someone, raising my fist and going, AND ANOTHER THING! I'm not a witch, so it feels like I shouldn't be the one to judge the craft they utilize in the film. And ultimately, I don't want to do that. It's just that I'm so struck by how little of it seems grounded in realism. Everything in this video up until this section, the craft legacy section, was finished before I saw the movie. So when I made fun of the Covenant for having too much exposition and for its fireball magic, 
I had no idea I was going to see it in this too. It surprised me given how many more experts they used on this film than they did with the craft. Seems like the magic is more cartoonish, which would be fine except it ultimately messes with the tone of the movie. I should say tones because there are so many and they're all all over the place. I don't think there is such a thing as having too many genres, not necessarily. You can use a lot of genres in one movie, you just have to blend them well because when you don't, the tonal shift is more noticeable and more confusing. Legacy wants to be a lighthearted take on the craft. It wants comic relief and a healthy romance. See, this movie actually does have a romance. It's also produced by Blumhouse Bloomhouse or whatever. And the horror of it is almost entirely absent, as is the thriller. I can't help but think of Happy Death Day, which blends romance, comedy, and horror like it's no problem. I think it could have worked here too, but Lister Jones really shies away from anything remotely related to horror. There are only two scenes that feel sort of scary, and both of them end with nothing happening. Lily hears a noise in the middle of the night. Is something in her room? Oh my god, that's kind of scary. No, it's just her stepbrother sleepwalking again. Lily hears screaming when she comes home. Is someone in trouble? Let's investigate. Oh, it's just her stepbrother watching porn. It would be fine if this movie wasn't a horror or thriller or even minutely influenced by those genres. But because it's produced by Jason Blum Blum Blah, it needs to have somewhat scary scenes even if they don't suit the overall tone of the movie. Right after the girls unite, they freeze time, they put a spell on a character called Timmy, a spell to make him less of a douchebag, they use their magic to put on makeup and briefly assault a bully, they play with auras. Most of this happens in montages, which I find frustrating. It's strange to say, but it almost feels as if we don't spend enough time with the coven or with their craft. Everything we know about them is contained in rushed lines of exposition and slow motion shots and montages. I wish I had a deeper sense of their friendship, a deeper sense even of these characters as individuals, but I don't. I was really excited to see Lovey Simone and Zoe Luna. I even hoped that Simone would play a much bigger role in the story than she actually did. I read a lot of interviews with the crew and the cast members before watching the film, and the interviews got me more excited about the movie than the actual trailer. Both Luna and Simone spoke candidly about their characters in the film, how Tabby learned witchcraft from her mother, and how Luna was kicked out by her parents and found a family in the coven. I read these interviews, and the expectations I kept at bay soared, only to plummet after watching the final product. Aside from Lily, no one in the coven develops, nor do they overcome anything. The ways they use magic to right the wrongs of the bullies in the school are relegated to two scenes that are, yes, Contained in a montage, the film isn't concerned with giving either of them a personality or substance outside of helping Lily find her true power. Frankie is treated as nothing but the comic relief. Just like telepathically communicating with you, MBD. JK, it's like a VBD for sure because now you're actually here and we all some shit IRL. But at least her personality is distinctive. But Lord and Tabby have nothing to grow from or build on. They exist to be part of the coven, but apart from the elements they sometimes control, they offer nothing to the story. The characters of the coven and the time they spend together suffers because of all the other elements being brought in. Lily has a growing bond with her youngest almost stepbrother. Out of all of them, he's the kindest toward her and I expected the moments they shared to lead to something substantive. Lister Jones is quoted as saying, I wanted to look at the ways in which toxic masculinity is also causing a lot of pain to men. So I thought, yeah, okay, maybe this will tie into that. Maybe the youngest son is sensitive and in touch with his feelings in a way that outrages his father. But no, none of this goes anywhere. It's just here taking up time and focus away from what could be a more coherent story, as does the subplot about Timmy. They put a spell on Timmy to make him his best self and he spends a lot of time with them, essentially becoming the unofficial fifth member of the coven, sans the magic. His whole storyline is about the impact of toxic masculinity on men. Once he becomes his best self, he's more sensitive more conscious, and he feels comfortable enough to come out to the girls as bisexual. So I'm not saying the director doesn't touch on this theme at all, just that it seemed like she was going to do it here too, but no. The theme of toxic masculinity and the oppressive patriarchy is good in and of itself, but like everything else in the movie, it's just too transparent. David Duchovny is like a self-help speaker or something, and when Lily goes into his office, she sees this article or something 
I swear I watched the movie. Anyway, it's called Man Up, that's the headline. It's like it wants to be clever, but it's just too ham-fisted for that. I like a lot of this for the most part, but I'm gonna nitpick and I'm gonna bring up the original which I was trying to avoid doing. It's just that Timmy changes instantly. He goes from raging, gaping asshole to sensitive, open-minded, and kind. It's as if everything from before has been erased. When I was watching, I couldn't help but think of Skeet as Chris and how he behaved after Sarah put the love spell on him. He was confused. In the overall scheme of things, this is a really subtle choice in the original movie, but it's one that I absolutely love. There's this push and pull. He doesn't know why he suddenly can't stop thinking about Sarah. He doesn't understand it, and you can tell he doesn't understand it. My favorite part of this is when they go to mass and his friends are teasing him about it, and he just stares at them. It's almost like he wants to be there, but he can't move. In this movie, Timmy just wakes up as a new person. There's no push and pull, no confusion, no nothing. He's just different overnight. I guess I should just be thankful that he's changed though. But I think many of these scenes are too on the nose. They're themes giving up on the allure of nuance in favor of beating you to death with it. This subplot only exists to develop the worst subplot. David Duchovny is actually a warlock and he wants to steal Lily's power just like he did her birth mother. Oh yeah, she was adopted and had no idea. Her birth mother is Nancy Downs, and Nancy made her adoptive mom promise not to tell Lily about her legacy. And see here, this is where the movie gets hyper convoluted. The film already crams in too many themes and too much exposition and too many subplots, all with a 90 minute runtime. It leaves none of the scenes or characters room to breathe, let alone develop, and what you end up with is a bloated, congested story and an ending that does not feel earned. I loathe that there are so many subplots and all of them revolve around Lily. I loathe that this story is supposed to celebrate womanhood of every identity and somehow we only view the story through Lily. I loathe that the filmmakers went on and on about how important it is that this story needs to be told, but did little to make it worth telling. It prides itself on highlighting intersectional girlhood, and it prides itself on telling a new, different story, but for some reason that story is still told from the perspective of a cis white girl. What happened to all that backstory, all that rich characters that the actresses were talking about in their interviews? What happened between production and the movie coming out. They hint at Tabby's feelings about racism, and that's about it. We never experience anything with anyone other than Lily, so it makes the film's inclusivity feel like some kind of cheap prop. There's this review that I saw on Letterboxd after I finished this video, and it made me realize that this is exactly what I meant by everything I just said. The review said something along the lines of the movie getting points for the representation, and I thought, yeah, that's what this feels like. It doesn't feel like real representation, it feels like give me points for all of this representation. So what, the characters only exist to support the main girl who is, yeah, white and cis and not a huge deviation from the norm. Give me the points, please. But the only character who changes and develops is Lily, and I guess Timmy does too. Outside of those two, I know nothing about anyone else, and none of them really have flaws. Apparently, a lot of people think the craft is anti-woman propaganda, because in the end, Nancy turns on Sarah. I didn't know that. I'd like the coven to have a happy ending, but damn, I never thought it was anti-woman. I still don't. If I thought that, I'd, I'd guess I have to think that Chronicle is anti-man. These characters are flawed. Sarah is almost assaulted by Chris, and for that, she blames herself. Which actually happens to a lot of survivors of sexual assault. She blames herself for everything, really. For her mom dying, for her own unhappiness, and later for Chris's death. Because she thinks if she hadn't put a love spell on him, he wouldn't have tried to hurt her, and Nancy wouldn't have hurt him. It's flawed thinking. But she's a flawed character, and I like that. So she tries to bind Nancy, and Nancy's like, what the fuck? I protect you from this douchebag, and you bind me? Oh, it's on like Donkey Kong. But also, Sarah's attempt to bind her is doubly enraging because this is all Nancy really has. It means everything to her, and Sarah tried to take it away. <laughs> So Nancy tries to kill her. Say what you want about it, but I like that these characters do messed up things to each other, and I like that they're flawed. I don't think characters being flawed makes the movie anti-woman. I don't think Jennifer's Body, for example, is less of a feminist horror film because two girls are fighting each other in the end. 
I think it's a testament to the complexity of these two characters that they clash, and that their clashing makes sense. Lister Jones made a point of the girls in the coven not going against each other in the end, and that alone is a choice that I applaud. But in doing that, I think she accidentally forgot to write any of these characters with any flaws. They're all perfect. They're all kind and open-minded and tolerant and none of them ever do anything bad. And even though they think for like 10 seconds that the love spell Lily later puts on Chris hurts him in the end, they realize it didn't so hooray, they're good. They don't grow, they don't change, they stay in a stagnant state of perfection. Say what you will about the craft, but at least all the characters make mistakes. God, remember mistakes? These actresses aren't bad. I love the life they bring to these characters, even if they are ill-defined. And they all deserved a better movie than this. All the mishaps of this film could have easily been rectified by one thing. Maybe this shouldn't be a movie. And I don't mean it shouldn't exist. I think there's themes here that would be great for a different format. With all the things it tries to fit into 90 minutes, and how none of the arcs have enough time to play out, it's clear that this movie was better off as a show. As a movie, it wears too many hats, and because it's wearing so many, it doesn't really wear one that well. But as a show, this probably could have been great. But there are things that I did enjoy about the movie. I really liked Lily's relationship with her mother. I think the two actresses, Michelle Monaghan and and the, and the actress who plays Lily. I think they hit it off and they had a lot of chemistry and I don't see a lot of that in like teen thrillers or teen dramas, you know, the main character having a good relationship with a parent. And that was refreshing and it was nice and this is where Zoe Lister-Jones is really skilled at these conversations and this natural relationship between Lily and her mom. I've always said that I love the craft. The only thing I would change is that the coven would live happily ever after. And there you go. They live happily ever after. That's awesome, I guess. I like that they got Feruza back. And I like that Nancy, I don't know, she's reunited with her daughter. It's a happier ending. A lot of people don't like the fact that they aren't goth in this, but... I don't really mind that at all. In fact, I like it. I think having a coven that's into glitter and pastels and girly stuff, that's fun too. And doesn't necessarily have to be exactly the same, and I'm glad it isn't exactly the same. I just wish the characters themselves had more identity. God, do I wish that. I wish I had more black friends. You're the director. You could have given her more black friends. Why wouldn't you give her more black friends and just bring this up like it was nothing? Yeah, it's all good. Y'all know trans girls got her own magic anyway. Why don't we learn anything about her? <laughs> this movie also dates itself a lot. There's like little Xan on the wall and they talk about Janet Mock and Princess Nokia and it's just so much references to a certain time period. Um... A very interesting choice, indeed. Indeed. Uh, I'm gonna go watch Bring It On like 16 times. One girl lays down and you surround her and you, you put your fingers underneath. You put your fingers where? <laughs> Thank you.